Keep it going. Uh, I'm Zach Brown, and Anna and Trond and I will all be talking. Uh, we're going to talk about the copy offloading work, uh, which it's now called. It's been called a bunch of other things in the past. I can give a brief overview and background on how we got here. Um, right, so usually copy files, and we're only talking about copying files at the moment. Uh, you know, you read all the pages in, you write them all out. So you have to bring that data all the way up and back down across whatever transports you're talking about. Over time, a bunch of different transports have grown methods to do the copying on your behalf. Um, I think the SCSI guys were first with all the xcopy stuff, and there's a lot of detail there I'm happily ignorant of, but they were the first to sort of start to put pressure on the stack to be able to implement this stuff. Um, OCFS2, on behalf of copying VM guest images, grew their own file system specific way to share blocks between files. It's still a block file system, but in its metadata, it can have share files share the same blocks. That's the reflink stuff. Uh, that was sort of the first place this appeared in Linux. Uh, you know, and then as Butterfest developed, this, they got the same thing. So two block file systems can do their own metadata hacks. Uh, the NFS, the current draft, it's still current, right, 4.2? Uh, they introduced an operation where you can ask the server to do this copy on your behalf. So instead of reading all the file data, from a handle and writing it back out the other side. You tell a file, for these handles, do some work for me. Please tell me when it's done. Uh, and we still don't have any real way to do that as an interface from an application in Linux. So that's, it's been talked about a few times. There have been a few prototypes. And I foolishly stuck my neck out and said, sure, let's just get this thing going. Pointing out that in Microsoft, they use this today. Yeah, yeah, in Windows yeah. Windows 2012, yeah, yeah. and it's supported by VMware. So we're, we're Although we've talked about it for years, we're actually slow. We're yeah. behind the ball, the others. Yeah, and it's relatively rare for us to be so behind the ball on this one, which hasn't been a priority, I guess. But yeah, so I say, we've been talking about this for a long time. Other people, this is operating in the field. Um, so there was a prototype where they took the OCFS2 ioctl and sort of hoisted it up into its own syscall. That was called copy file in the prototype. Something like that. So the point was, it's a full file copy, rather than specifying a range of a file you will copy. Uh, and you could also specify some metadata was copied along with that, so that was a big discussion. It sort of fizzled out. Um, the current, well, so and then I got involved and we changed it into copying file ranges between existing files, so you're no longer using an interface to create a new file. You just have two files and you copy bytes between them. We had a syscall and that, adding a new syscall is its own set of things. Um, and when that patch was being kicked around, someone suggested that, you know, we have this thing called splice. It has all the same arguments. Arguably, it's what the interface does. Maybe we should just accelerate that. And Rick and I are like, oh, you're a crazy person. This is something else. Uh, and I went down to actually look at what that meant, and it makes a ton of sense. So that's the current patch that's out there is just a simple way. So I don't know if everybody's familiar with splice. Usually you, the notion behind splice as it was introduced is that you have a thing that you store a logical copy of pages in, and then you can push those copies somewhere else. It's two, a two-stage operation. You copy stuff from a file into a thing, and then from the thing into another file. You do two syscalls. But the syscall arguments are copy from this file at this offset to this file at this offset. It's just one of the files is a pipe in either end. Uh, and so to accelerate this file to file copy, we said, OK, so they're both files, and there isn't a, a, a blob you're storing the data in in between. The syscall sees both the source and the destination. Uh, and then down in the guts, we have a little call out to the file systems, because the file systems want to see both files, because they have to do locking and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so that's the current prototype. Uh, and in my work, I plumb the ButterFS side under it, because that's what I do. Um, the OCFS2 OCFS guys could. I don't think they have yet. Their current code is to just do file granular. The structures on disk, obviously, can have block ranges copied between, um, but they haven't done the code yet. Uh, and the NFS one, Anna's done the work, and there's, that is, I think, the real driver behind this. The ButterFS guys think this is kind of cool, but the NFS people are really pushing for it, because it makes a huge difference for them, because it comes over the wire, instead of just up and down the block stack. Uh, so I think that's where it stands, and I guess what I'm most interested in the audience today is how you want to use this thing. Um, do you want to use this thing? Can you not use this thing, because we're proposing something that's too simple? Um, how would you like to be able to, as an application, specify that you want to copy stuff and actually use the thing? And I, I believe, 
and this isn't from firsthand Windows 2012 knowledge, but from SDC a couple years ago, the Windows API, I believe, also requires you to have pre-existing files as a target so. without being, they have restrictions on being not sparsely allocated as well. Maybe. Maybe, Maybe it's even practice. already pre-allocated or something. So we're not out of the kind of, out of the crowd here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what, what Zach came up with with Splice makes, makes sense. So, and I'll just remind people, if we have comments, I have a mic, I'll run around and give people a mic. So, um, if I understand you right, you, you want to copy from two existing, from an existing file to another. Does it work? Do I need to turn it yeah. on? There's a green light, it should be on. It's on, but I don't know. Put it in your mouth. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not used to it. Yeah. Um, so, if you copy to an existing file, um, now, for NFS, I, I'm not sure how it works with PNFS. With, with plain NFS, it would work because you only have one storage server. But if you have um, multiple st storage servers, so with, with Lasta, Ceph, and um, I'm working for the Pranova file system, so if you would copy to an existing file, you still would need, mostly need to go over the network because you would, go, you would tell maybe your storage server, copy this file, but the other chunks of the file are on another server, so you, so you would spare maybe the, the copy call from, from one from the client to the server, but you still would have it between the servers. So it would be nice to at least have an interface to say, I want to copy this file, so that this file, that the, the copy, that the meta servers or the, the um, um, application, or no, the, um, so something that allocates the chunks so that um, the the metadata know that the file is a copy and that the chunks will be on the same storage server so that you don't say I create a file, the chunks of the file will be on, on storage servers um, 123 and the next one will be on 465 or so. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that's true, but that's all very, very file system specific, right? None of that is true for ButterFS or NFS or any of that stuff. Um, Well, right, but so when I say that, what I mean is in the kernel code that implements this accelerated offloading stuff, it would have to do all that junk. I don't see that there's an opportunity in the interface other than making file granular. And but we need problems. some kind of, of call um, for the, some kind of syscall, whatever, to say I want to make a copy of this. I just um, I want to create a new file which will be a copy uh, of another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you want it to be back to the copy file thing. And the problem with that is that it's file granular and unless you want to start going asynchronous, that's going to take a really long time, and that's a problem. And, and we'll let Tron continue with that, I guess. No, no, I'm, I'm just interested in exactly what your application is. You know, the, the main thing that we are targeting uh, copy offload for is things like provisioning your virtual machines, right? Where, you know, you usually want to do um, a, a um, copy on write type operation. Okay. So, so, so most of the time, you know, the, the copy, the copy itself, is merely about you know updating a few block pointers somewhere. You know, typically that's what 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 um, you know ButterFS does with with Reflink. Um, that's what you know we expect um, our, our NetApp filers will do internally. You know. um, so, so our, our main um, our main use case. Is, is this zero, basically a zero copy situation where you're not moving data around at all? Well, from, from user, take it from user point of view. If a user want, just wants to copy a file um, or make copy on write it off, but now you would create another file and the, the, um, the file has the chunks allocated on another server, it wouldn't help you at all or it would only slightly help you. If you would need, um, if you would do some, some kind of call whatever, I want to, this, 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 this other file is a copy of the first one, then everything would work out perfectly fine. So again, I think even with user space file systems like Gluster or Ceph or something like this, there are some times when this API won't help you, right? Yeah. If you yeah. really have a networked clustered file server that has, you know, a link to, to the subarctic, you know, station as the back end, you won't get efficiency out of this. So we could make it provisional on making copies of ranges based on speed or speed up or something, but I don't think we can give you all the control at this level unless you want to do the 
API calls yourself. Like SCSI, for example, SCSI target devices, you can send SCSI copy commands today, raw, by bypassing the stack. You can do this. No one does it, because it's very complicated. But I think for the majority of cases that are coming to production, you can pre-allocate a file, pre-allocate the target file, and do the copy range. You know, the range could be the whole file, all the sure, bytes. If you wanted. There's no restriction there. But you have to be careful that it's, it's still meaningful to do that. Right? You could go out to lunch for an hour if you're doing physical block copy with, with the SATA back end. Yeah, let me, let me try and restate, because you're absolutely right. I mean, his correct point is that you can't offload if you've already created the destination and it didn't know about the source because you have to create the destination such that it can get at all the existing blocks on the source. Mm -hmm. If you spread it across the wrong servers, you're done. So I agree that what we're proposing is just a simpler data plane operation. In, the, in this case, it might not always help. And yeah. sorry, if you want to do actual file creation acceleration offloading, it's a different scope of work. And that's, it's just more work, and it's not personally what I'm interested in. Having worked on IIO for so long, async is terrible, yeah. right? And for our use case, if you're copying giant ranges of data, if you do the whole file at a time, you start to want it to make it async, and that's a problem. And if you want to do file creation stuff accelerated, you start to get into VFS, dentary lifetime stuff. It's, a, it's doable. All of it's doable. It's a lot more work than just copying file data between. So that's where we're starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Sure. Yeah, and, and I'm not, so if you and people want to do it, go to town. <laughs> this is just the data plane side. And another way to look at this is that we already have this IOCTL in OCFS2 and ButterFS, and now NFS wants to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in ButterFS it's cloned. But. So I, I see the problem of sometimes copying fast and sometimes it taking for a long time is like moving between the same mount point and moving across two mount yeah. points. Yeah, there's lots of The user has like to know. Uh, so, and the way we've been thinking about that, and you can give me feedback, is if we had a flag in the operation to say, just return an error if this is not going to be accelerated. And you go back to the old session. Yeah, because also, and I mean, something to point out is that because we're doing it under splice, it can transparently fall back to doing buffered reads and writes without going back to user space. I mean, this is the data path that implements send file today. We just sort of add a flag to splice, and now you can do it with both arguments specified in so, one call. So I'd say, what do people prefer? Would you like it to fall back to the two-hour copy of a multi-terabyte image? It depends or would on you the like caller. to know? Some people want a copy because they want copies. <laughs> they want yeah. resiliency. Um, I, think, I think the important thing is to know what's going to happen. I mean, the okay. biggest problem with nope. the fallbacks nope. is nope. Then, then it's not useful. I disagree. If you have a thing you want to happen, and as it's happening, you find out it's not happening, <laughs> you can return an error. Right. You want to know it's not going to happen before you do nope. it. Because the way this plums down through everything, you're, you're asking for a probe to go down and discover what's going to happen. Now that has to be pinned when you come back, and then it happens again. It's not the way the stacking works. Yeah, but what, what would happen, Anthony, is you would, you would try it. You'd get a not supported or not accelerated or whatever. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then you'd have to go back to the old-fashioned copy. And, and that's OK. I mean, that's OK. But silently falling back yes. is, yeah, yeah. is a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. That, yeah. That's my yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so what right, we're saying right. is a flag, if in your case you care, it'll return an error if it couldn't accelerate. Right. But do people see value in having the fallback to having the kernel copy all the data for you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, NFSD has to do it. Okay. Right. I mean, when the f underlying file system can't accelerate these things, there's still a huge benefit in not giving it all the way to the NFS client. Okay. So. Other questions? You have to be careful, Fernando. You put your hand on your head, and I give you a mic. <laughs> I think I have anything else. Um, I guess I should mention that there's still going to be file system specific quirks uh, because the, the, the actual shared interface layer is pretty thin. It just hands it off to the file system, and the file system sometimes may or may not be able to accelerate. So you're not going to be able to say, mm, and I hate to say this, but that means the interface in some ways will be like ODirect and that you have to kind of know that there's going to be underlying requirements imposed on you. So, but that's just the way file systems work, so that shouldn't be too surprising. But it should be mentioned. No one has questions. I'll let you guys show your pretty pictures. Show pretty pictures. I just have a question about the ButterFS implementation of this, because there's a you, chance yeah. of 
you're just not replicating the data in ButterFS, just creating a new pointer. If by chance, and if the you user, certainty, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if the user actually wants resiliency yeah. in, in, in terms of disks uh, and replication, is there going to be a flag for that so that the file system doesn't? Yeah, it's super easy for us to add. Um, I mean, and, and I could see someone saying they want that, whether people use it or not, right? It's the trade off. Right. It's trivial enough to add another bit, and ButterFS can fail if that bit set. Mm -hmm. um, and that, but that's, this is the sort of uncertainty that is present in the interface, and we haven't gotten a ton of traction on. So honestly, at this point, we're just going to do what works. And unless people object, sorry, <laughs> we're not going to wait for silent buy-in. Yeah. Well, for, for, for ButterFS, that would basically just be the fallback to the, yeah. the, the, yeah, the yeah, copy. Yeah. Don't, don't copy using the patch cache, right? Unless it wanted to do the X copy yeah, stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so, so, so it's, it, it should be easily doable through a flag. Yeah, yeah, it's trivial to implement for ButterFS. Yeah. And, and I think you work for a company that makes a storage device. And if you didn't see my earlier talk, we always lie to you about whether we actually copy blocks or not anyway. <laughs> so just because we said we made a new copy didn't mean we actually wrote it. Do you want to do slides? of magnitude we're talking about. Hey, so I'm Anna. I've been working on the NFS side of things. So currently, like Zach said, we're reading from the disk and then reading from the network and writing everything back to copy files. And this is really slow. So there was a copy operation added to the 4.2 draft. It's not published as a spec yet, but I'm still working but I'm already working on the prototype code just to get it going. Uh, it su supports both server, want single server copies and server to server, which I think answers the PNFS question that Bernd had earlier. So there is a way to copy files from one server to another using, say, a back, back end IP link or something that could be faster than just over Ethernet. So that would help accelerate for the PNFS case. I didn't implement that since it's server work and I mostly do client stuff. So I'm leaving that for someone else. Um, so yeah, my patches were done on top of Zach Brown's. It's done using, right now, send file. So <clears throat> seems to work. So basically the results, copying say, up to, say, a two gigabyte file takes two minutes just to run. When I add the copy offloading and acceleration, it gets it down to six seconds. This is done over ext4. And yeah, so still a copy on the server. And with ButterFS, it was 0.1 seconds for regardless of the size, because it just does the ref link. So it seriously helps to copy large files just by doing it only on the server. And having a way to get into that is pretty good for storage companies and users. <laughs> For the splice call, I mean, it's byte ranges or whatever. And yes, everything there, seems to line up exactly. So, is, is there some minimum, maximum block size, or is that all pre-negotiated? Uh, it takes <clears throat> a base offset, <clears throat> and then a range, or just a length to copy from. So, it seems to line up to what were, the arguments were given. Yeah, and I, I don't remember. And the SCSI group implemented two. There's X copy and uh, token-based copy. Pardon. <clears throat> At least three or four, but I think there's there were two that we've looked at, and I th I think they're also I think they're are they they're sector oriented, right? I assume. So. You guys might know. You you disk people might know. Do you do you know what the token copy is? Granularity. I think it's sector. Definitely sector. Yeah. All right. So that was all that I had. Just showing results and that it's actually useful. So if there's any questions. 
All right, I guess I'll pass it off to yeah. Trond. So I think, so how, how close are we to having it? So again, you know, Trond, we were talking before, I mean, it's not actually a ratified spec yet, the four two bits. Right, so I've got draft patches out. I still have a little bit of polishing left to do against Zach's most recent updates. So I'll hopefully have those posted in the next couple weeks. And whenever the draft is out, or probably earlier, it could be right. Right, I, I, I can probably speak a little bit to that. So the status of the draft is um, the copy op operation, we, we've got broad understanding of what we want to achieve with it. And we have broad understanding of how we should implement it um, for local, so intra-server copies. So, you know, you're talking to one, one server and it does the copy from, you know, one file to another on its file systems. Um, you know, the debate that's sort of going on within the, uh, the NFS community now is basically about how to do intra-server copy. Um, and the main problem there is that you have, you know, issues of security issues, you know, authorization. How do you, you know, let server, server B know that server A is allowed to read data from it? Um, and, you know, we have various solutions for that, um, but there is a feeling within the ITF that they are still inc incompletely described. So Would, what we've... Does um, this work with your... Can you go between two file system instances? No, right? Yes. Uh, we, 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 uh, the, the interface that we're, that we're implementing allows, allows for all this. Anna's patch is... Um, you know, that, that, that she's implemented um, are basically designed for doing the in, intra-server copy only mm -hmm. because, as I said, that looks as if it's more or less nailed. Right. So... It can always be updated later. Right. The other, the other thing to note is that, um, you know, SIFS, which is the competing, you know, network file system, um, uh, already has... As, as you mentioned earlier, an implementation of this, that's all set, uh, and that, um, you know, could be implemented by the, by the, the Samba community anytime, but you know, soon. No Samba support for it yet. Right. What, what will the spec say in terms of atomicity of the copy operation, and when you're doing parallel NFS, um, that so could be, turn into a giant distributed right, transaction? So so, so, so the way we do atomicity in, in NFS in general is through locking, right? So there is the way that, the reason why we're doing a, a data only copy rather than doing the full create file, et cetera, is to allow um, the application to, to basically create the file, apply locks you know, on either side if it needs them. Uh, in order to well, I'm it. talking about the atomicity of the copy operation itself. Um, so if you say copy a terabyte um, and something goes wrong in the middle, you oh. know, what's, what's the semantics? The, the, uh, there are no guarantees. It will return an error, and then, but there are no guarantees you know, that the copy is linear or anything like that. They, so you have to assume you, it's all garbage. You have to, you um, have to, yes, the current spec basically says that you have to assume um, you, you have to redo the, the entire copy. So that, that's something that the splice system call is going to have to right. pass up or so, do something about. Right. Well, I think, I mean, the data is already pre it's, it's already been, it hasn't been pre-allocated with the target, right? The file exists, but it, it, it's overwrite. It, it, has, could be if it's overwrite. it could be. So it's not necessarily pre-allocated, but I think you could end up with Blocks of zeros, random zeros, or unmapped data, or a short file, or almost anything. Yeah, yeah, right. and I mean that's the sad truth today. I mean buffered writes in ext whatever. If you're not doing data journaling, you can get torn writes during write back and power failures. It's yeah. I mean that's something you need to reflect a system call error that says it will return an error. Yes. Not only did it not work, but I trashed those blocks. No, an error means you're hosed. I mean it's yeah. undefined the regions that were on being yeah. copied. That's the interface, and you know not great, but unless we actually log everything. That's what it's going to be. <clears throat> if it's initial and contiguous, it can. If, but I don't know if the wire op does that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the NFS wire op only tells the client that there was an error. 
but but one of the one of the dirty little secrets about the the splice copy is that it basically forces you to to um, cut your your copy up into two gigabyte chunks anyway because it's not it, uh, the splice does not allow for a full 64 bit uh, uh, copy of, of your data it's uh, it's uh, the 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 the, uh, the size argument is is a 32 bit value yes so is there a way to um, abort a copy uh, at the protocol level to abort a copy? Yes. So yes, doing... there are operations for that in NFS. Okay. I haven't implemented them. So, I mean, that would seem to be an issue with the splice call because there's no way to abort a split. Sorry? I know, but that's not good from a programmatic perspective. I mean, we don't want to kill a thread to abort it. So, uh, no, it's horrible. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, has anybody looked at doing an AIO interface yeah. for? No. I would argue, I mean, if you do, if you send a gigabyte write down to a disk array today and you drop power or you're, you seg fault or something, you have no idea what happened, right? That's okay. Well, why is this any different? People think we put your data down there, but you might have holes and. We never, never do that with SCSI, right? We never do that with, with read or write. Read or write, yeah. If you do an NFS gigabyte write. Yeah, I guess the difference though is typically, at least for the use cases I care about, you're generally not doing terabyte or. But, but I, I, I'll, I'll go back to, like, with NFS, if you're copying two virtual machine images through NFS today with a big read and a big write call, it might not go out unless you do an F sync in any order. It could go out in, in fact, <laughs> NFS has this really annoying habitron. Thank you. For paging things out in like reverse, re reverse really page order, right? It comes out in like totally random crap order, which drives us crazy in the backend file systems. Yeah, no, I mean we're being kind of flippant, and you're absolutely right. It, this it is a can. thing. It can, but it but asynchronous is a it's much bigger it's problem. A page, it's a page cache fault. It's a VMP. Well, so splice is really bad about silently falling back to copying and stuff like that. So well, I mean, if we have the flag, it won't be. Uh, right. But I mean, to give you some a little more depth, asynchronous is really hard in the kernel because everything, all the APIs are blocking and associated with the task. It's a problem. So we sidestep all that crap by saying, if you want responsive cancellation, do it in responsive chunks, depending on whatever your fabric is. Yeah. So you can control your exposure. So uh, I'm one of the rare people at NetApp that know nothing about NFS. Um, uh, I work on SAN. It's magic. It's, it's magic. It's all magic files. Um, so were there any, so I'm obviously as a SCSI nerd, I'm kind of amazed this didn't exist before, um, especially in the VMware style interactions. Were there any other out of band solutions for this that were outside of NFS? And can you talk about the differences between using those and this? Yeah, so like X copy with SCSI, right? I mean, it's just like everybody has that. No, so, right. so well, let me. I mean, I'm talking in terms of NetApp, not in terms of Linux. OK, so, so again, the, the plan is just to, to clear that up. I mean, so we do plan to have a back end for SCSI offload as well, whether it's the token copy for the T10 right. token or the X, X copy or, or whatever. Um, I think Martin was working on patches, but he's gone silent for a couple of months. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they need to be refreshed. So hopefully we'll have SCSI support as well. And if vendors have non-SCSI, non-NFS, non-local file system offload stuff, we should figure out how to plumb that in as well. Right. No, no, it should, it should go down below the file system, I think. Right. But, but, but to answer, answer the question that, you know, there have been several um, uh, proprietary um, protocols in use here. You know, VMware, vMotion being the most complete one. Now they, they hook into pretty much every vendor's you know private stack to do to do this this sort of thing. So what we what what, what we're doing here is basically just democratizing that, you know, providing a, a, a system call interface that everybody can use and, and achieve the same. Right. Well, 
Well, so uh, a lib storage management does this today. So a lot of vendors have copy offload and proprietary interfaces for it. There's a user space library lib storage management that provides a unified interface on top of it. So it is there in user space today. And there are users of that in user space. I mean, I can talk about the block side of it. Uh, it. I don't know if you know a lot about Odirect, but the way it's implemented, it's kind of a shared set of libraries that uh, for each file system coordinate sending block IOs up and down. That's how you'd implement this SCSI copy operation as well. All the block file systems would call into a helper that lock the files and get the block mappings and send the BIOs out. So each file system needs to be modified, yeah, and sometimes it can be pretty sketchy because of all the locking and consistency stuff, but it's not a whole new crazy data paths in each file system. Odirect's the model. Not a great model, but there's that. Um, back on the system call. Any, any thought of making this work with VM splice? If the like if somebody M maps a file and then wants to copy copy that somewhere? Handing out mics all day. Uh, no, because <laughs> uh, that, I mean, in theory, you could have little wrappers that invalidate all the mappings and then take the offsets and the files of the mappings and call down. The, 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 the file system is going to have to you know, flush whatever dirty pages yeah, yeah. are there anyway. I mean, it would be a relatively small amount of code to do that API sugar, but uh, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's doable, but it's, it's a weird thing. Yeah. Just standard MMAP. He's just saying you could use an MMAP range as the argument, and it would just be a weird API semantic thing. Right. Yeah, and I don't know why you'd do that, but you but could. I mean, it sounds to me as if you know that's basically duplicating MSync to a, a certain extent, right? Well, you might have a different source file and target file. Oh. No, he's just yeah. It's just an entry into the path. Instead of having a file and an offset, you have a pointer. Well, you do the lookup. Well, you, 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 can, you, can, already, you can already M map um, it into an O direct file or some uh, file descriptor or something like that. At some point, the world just yeah. explodes. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it gets, it, you can do all sorts of messy things like that, but that's, that's really a different process. You're basically taking from the, the page cache or you know, some memory bit rather than doing you know, a, a copy oper operation at the, at the uh, file level. Yeah, invalidate usually. Right. Well, we, we can take this offline. Yeah. Okay, so we have, we have those up there. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, the copy interface for user space, is that specified or splice? Splice is the proposal because it specif no that's the change you have a flag and both file descriptors are files and splice is better because you specify the destination offset instead of it being in the file descriptor so anybody want to use it anybody hate it <laughs> <laughs> or should we go back and debate it for another 5 years uh, one thing to point out is that copy is using this stuff today. It just has file system queries to call OCFS2 or ButterFS, and this would let it just call syscall. Because to do multiple, you need to have a thread pool because it blocks. So an AIO interface would be much, much nicer. You're I, welcome I know. to it, friend. Yeah. <laughs> No, seriously. <laughs> Rick asked, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how much you know about AAO. It's only A when. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Google for an LCA talk on AAO. Yeah. Why oh, I hate this is the I, subtitle. I have done a similar talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, you're right. And so that, there have been API variants proposed that uh, vector everything. And that's just more complexity. So once we get people using this, we'll have. Splice V, I mean, right? Honestly, I mean, it's I mean, having argued Java people about this. Whether we make a thread in the kernel or you make a thread yeah. in user space, who cares? No, I mean he's right. If well, I do, because then I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we were pixies and the kernel was an event loop, AIO would be AIO, <laughs> but it's not.
would be nice to figure out how to eventually get support for those in as well, so that you can offload and then Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, that's, that's feedback, right? well, that's Martin's world. I think they'd consume a BIO and just have to process it accordingly. Yeah, you'll see hopefully these things coming down in a consumable way. But you'd have to be BIO block driver, not a request. Not a request? No, I, I guess. Yeah, 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 I think so. If that's Martin, I don't know, I'm making that up. We can assign anything to Martin right now. <laughs> Five till. We have you can have a seven minute break, and then Carlos can start off with the uh, device mapper, DM pin, and XFS stuff, or we can just go straight forward and roll forward until lunch, which is at noon. Any preferences? <coughs> Anybody want a break? Power on. Power on. Power on. Carlos. Okay. Was that a question? <laughs>